Yeah, my focus is entirely on voice in games. When I was first invited to join the game industry to run voice studios, you know, I thought it was going to be easy. Production was in my blood. I'd grown up in the studio, in theater and in TV. But I couldn't have been more wrong. 18 years ago, I'd spent the afternoon working with an actor on a role for a game. I'd seen him playing a role on, on stage, and I knew he was superb. He was talented, eager, and committed. But when faced with the complexity and the size of the script and the methods we were using, he gave up saying that games just didn't fit his process. For me, the experience turned out to be pretty much the catalyst for a journey, initially just focusing on how to make games fit with the, act with the actor's process. I wanted the best classically trained actors to embrace games and for game developers to resource actors in a way that didn't compromise development. Little did I think that the journey would branch out into human evolution, into encounters with spies, with, into philosophy and neuroscience, and that it would lead to redesigning the recording studio, learning to design software and to manage programs, and running workshops for three of the world's leading acting studios. Yeah. Whatever objective we have for recording voice, whether it's a voice announcing a player's victory, a tutorial, a narrator, a player character, NPCs, or just AI or pure Walla. We have multiple choices of how we record. And obviously, those choices have an impact on the final outcome. And they have an impact on cost, on time, and on the team. Yet, the choices we make are influenced by our own past experiences and the experiences of others. And when I started writing this talk, I wanted something to illustrate how experience can be counterproductive and blinkerous. And I thought of the horse. The horse was the most advanced form of transport for over 5,000 years. And then came the Industrial Revolution, and then came the car. In production terms, games are the car to the horse of stage, film, radio, and TV. The methods that evolved over thousands of years for other media don't fit games production. Every year, we witness both the film and the games industry waste tens of millions being puzzled by the failure of what amounts to be putting oats in a fuel tank. If we just trust past wisdom, we can mess up. And to misquote the Bible, it's dumb putting new wine in old wineskins. It's dumb to cling to tra tra tradition if it doesn't serve us. When faced with the new, evolution teaches us it's better to be curious and to experiment with difference than it is to rely on what's gone before. And to illustrate my own experimentation with difference and to give you some takeaway, I'm just going to concentrate on one practice for recording voice. And that is recording with an actor alone in the recording studio. But and please, please remember that this is just my perspective. It's not a holy grail. It's just some under ideas that I've put into practice. The bottom line with voice is to have performance that is believable. And the biggest underlying cause of a weak performance in the game is not a bad script. It's not a bad actor. It's not a bad director. It is usually unknown, misunderstood, or miscommunicated context, and fixing context is easy. Context 
is at the heart of the mismatch between games and all other media. Context in other media is, giving, is a given, as you know how to perform because of the staging. For solo voice, there's a, there's a sterile studio. Yet for the performance to work, it has to be true to context. And it's not just a matter of what context you give. The factors that give the biggest impact are how you give context and when you give context. And now to just illustrate one version of how, I want you all just to imagine you've been shot at and you're hiding behind a chair in a room. Okay? Got it? Now, to imagine that scene, you have just tapped into more process processing power than every single device connected to the web. Combine that with the fact that our perceptions are unique to each of us based on our experiences, it is guaranteed that all, all of us will have imagined something different. The weakest and the slowest form of communication for context is language, period. If we get context wrong, it is likely the performance will be wrong. So the more context we give, the better. And the strongest communicator of context is pictures. So, you know, if you're using pictures, use screen grabs, video, or live gameplay. They connect the actor instantly to the environment with the precision. Use also character art and, and you know, item art, anything that will connect to um, the now. We've got a sofa in a room. You're all in that space now. But in addition to visuals, sound paints a picture too. The performances of other actors are essential if you want a connection with any degree of nuance. Also, sound effects play a massive role in nailing performance. For example, if the performance is not true to the sound of the environment, it is wrong, and wrong is not believable. You know, imagine if, if this was, a, you know, this room, and if I'm talking to somebody at the back of the room, I'm going to be projecting. If I get that wrong in any way, it's going to be too loud or too quiet. It's broken. It doesn't matter how good I am. If it's not connected to the environment, it doesn't work. And the final thing is music. It adds a powerful shortcut to the emotional core of the scene. I want the secret of what? Of your blueberry pie. In your dream. If we get out of this, you're going to tell me who you are. Yeah, in return for the secret of These things together make for precision. The last element of giving co context is when we give it. And this is where it really gets interesting. As it is generally, well, it was counterintuitive. It's, it's almost everything. And it's definitely from, from my own experience. Outside of games, production is a journey into believable performance. It's a process that starts with the script and builds towards fully orchestrated performance. By the time performance happens, everything is known with absolute precision. Script, character set, blocking, timing, props, costumes, lighting, everything. It's a process that combines many different skills, but the focus is a performance. And the script is usually simple, linear, and small. And this process is the horse. The reality is that games are different. For one, the scripts can be massive, complex, and non-linear. It's OK to admire other media, but to use their process can be putting oats into the tank. For example, don't waste precious resources trying to put a script into screenplay format. A game is not a screenplay. Don't kowtow to a reality that's not yours. If you do this, actors will think that this is the model you're following. And when they don't get what they want, you are the only one to blame. The trick, though, 
is to inspire the actor, to bring them into your reality, into your vision. And one of the keys is that this model is not the whole picture. If you zoom out, it actually looks something like this. Now, if you've ever picked up a book, an unknown book, and read it to a child, or if you've given an actor a script and they cold read it, you will experience what seems like magic. Frequently, the very, very first read will nail it. It's not magic. It is just instinct at play. Because all of the media are concerned with staging a performance, the instinctive cold read has limited value. It's not a focus. It's just the beginning of a process. However, the process is unnecessary if instinct can be resourced. The fact that we live every moment, every day, instinctively, is to our advantage. It is at the core of human survival, and the human brain is the reason for our survival. And reason, our reasoning, is the biggest reason. Too many reasons. Physically, humans are neither the fastest nor the strongest. Our senses are not the sharpest, but we think about stuff, and that modifies our responses. A, neuro a neurologist would say the brain has two prime functions, reaction and reason. The core process is actually instant. As soon as we react, we log and modify. And I'm going to illustrate this modification by taking you on a peaceful drive in the country with a classic internet meme. A screamer. Some of you jumped. Some of you have seen it before. The first time we see it, we jump. Instinct. The second, we jump less. We've modified. If you step out of instinct, there's a journey we must take to get back to the place where we can fake instinct. If I play that again, and I told you to jump, you would jump differently. It would be fake in it. Yeah? Instinct. The actor's craft is about faking instinct. Learning to do that costs the whole process. Capturing instinct surely makes sense. Yeah? That was the conclusion I came to. And it was spies that really tipped me over the edge. Spies have an objective of gathering information, and they use three prime method methods, observation, recruitment, and infiltration. And what is of interest is infiltration, as it's the primary key for unlocking the actor. Go up to any actor and ask them if they want to play a spy, and the answer will be yes. We all love spies in the movies. James Bond, Jason Bourne, Ethan Hunt, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Even the spy here in the room is nodding at that. The reason they're here is to check that I don't breach national security, and I'm not going to, and I'm not going to blow their cover. But by mentioning them, I have just put them on high alert. And they are not showing it. Why? Because spies are actors. And their training is not about a character being built by learning lines in a script. It's about being somebody they're not, a character in a real world. They are the best actors you'll ever meet. Their training is about instinct. Their lives and national security may depend on it. Instinct works. If 
we take the actor and approach their role as if they were a spy, it becomes character first. And this is the essence of all my work over the years. It's getting the actor to work as a spy, and it's easy. It's like throwing a switch. Their craft, in truth, is all about character. And at its core, it's relying on what it is to be human. And being human is living instinctively. To support the concept of actor as spy, I took the analogy to another level by remodeling the way I worked to mirror the way the spy is supported in the field. And actually, I took my lead from a movie, and it was Mission Impossible. You got the support team in a surveillance vehicle outside the embassy, and the spy is on the mission inside. So the first thing I did was to remodel the studio control room to be like the surveillance vehicle. I made the control room single purpose, mission only, to empower performance and record it. I wanted something pure. A standard studio doubles as a mix space. It has the engineer in the central position. As the di director is the chief, I made them, it took them into the central position with complete control. And I moved the engineer to the side. They are the tech expert, silently monitoring and invisible, capturing the performance, yet always on hand when there's an issue, just like the tech guy in the truck. Then I removed the talk back button. The mic between the, the control room and the booth is always open. We work together as a team with the actor on the mission together. Talk back isolates. You know, we call it the big paranoia button. But the actor, as an actor, needs to be safe and supported at all times. The main rule of the space is that it's the job of everything and everyone in the control room to support the actor in achieving their mission. And the second thing I did was to change the booth. And the booth becomes like the embassy. It's the place where the actor achieves their objective. This is where we immerse them and support them in their moment. And the first thing I did there was to change the script. I got rid of paper. I got it on screen using Excel, and, and, and it was controlled by the director. We use a format that fits the need of the game. A database or anything else you can use to import or export from the engine would do fine too. But if the, and if, and if the actor asks for a specifically formatted script, we just educate them and they get it. The script is irre irrelevant in that sense. What's relevant is what we communicate and how we communicate it. The next thing was the asset rec recall for context. This is about the now. This is so the actor can be in the moment. So I created an asset player for the director so they could share context with the, the, with the actor. It's not rocket science. It just connects on an instant recall. Timing is everything. So all the visual and audio assets and the script including every single take of every other performance, is instantly at the fingertips of the director, so the actor can be immersed. I also didn't want the studio tech to get in the way of the performance. I wanted it to be in, as invisible as possible. But that's the actor in the studio. So I removed the static microphones and had the mic attached to the actor. It also enables the actor to move and live the character. The static mic is a cage. It constrains performance. You know, if you, you want to move, the actor, you want the actor being the character. Constraint can be heard. Locked in front of a microphone is a bag of wrong. But finally, with the objective of wanting the magic of instinct without the cost of having to fake it, you don't give 
the actor, the script in advance. You know, when I first proposed this, the ridicule was instant and often vitriolic. And in truth, I was probably first in line. This was the biggest clash between the horse and the car. Tradition builds from the script to performance. Yet as soon as the script is read, the advantage, any advantage of instinct is lost. An instinct is magic. I wish I'd filmed you jumping earlier. The first thing that brought me to consider no script in advance was the actor's process. You know, it doesn't fit with complexity unless you have the resources to waste. I understood that instinct made sense both for the spy and for the improv actor as they don't have a script. But I got kind of stuck on why cold reading works. Because it's different. But then I saw a meme that appeared in 2003. This is the world of psycholinguistics. Although Cambridge University denied being the source, they did acknowledge the reality with a few caveats. However, it was the essence of this that unlocked why cold reading works. How we, re how we read is not how we think we read. The topic is fascinating. There aren't enough really hours in a lifetime to research it. You know, I discovered sight reading to be a kind of window into the heart of, the, of evolution that connects anthropology to psychology, neurology, and phil philosophy. That, you know, the list just goes on. And, and personally, I got really hooked on this subject and, and researching it a lot. But to help me absorb more, um, I picked up a book on speed reading uh, by the author David Butler. And it had a brain on the cover. It kind of attracted me. But his method is based on the premise of seeing meaning, not words. The intent behind the words. This is engaging the imagination, the imaging engine at the core of our amazing brains. It is the connection at the heart of our survival as a species between reason and reaction. It's instinct. And the truth is, I'm only scratching at the surface with the research. But the insights I gained gave me the real confidence to be bold and to step out with no script in advance. And it was 12 years ago when I finally changed the studios in London. My goal was always to empower, to liberate, and inspire performance. You know, for me, it worked. And last year, I built the vault here in Santa Monica to demonstrate the methodology, the results of all the work we've been doing. Because it's actually easy to apply, to grasp the concept. And I'm just going to show you another video. Um, and this is actually from the vault. And it's introducing the actor Deborah Wilson to the method that to the method. Um, and I used the sample from the game I showed earlier. It was called Blues and Bullets. Um, the key of the method is character first. The preparation is working with the actor on who they are playing, just like with the spy going undercover. All you do is brief them for their objective, then drop them into the game world. Doing the character setup with Deborah took less than a minute. And the video starts with guns blazing. Yeah, I have one of those faces. I know, I've seen it before. Good for you. OK, I'm going to bring in the music now. I know, I've seen it before. Yeah, good for you. I want the secret. Of what? Of your blueberry pie. In your dreams. If we get out of this, you're going to tell me who you are. In return for the secret ingredient. Deal. Oh no, keep going up! Keep going up! <laughs> keep going up! One more, one more, one more page. When you actually hear production in your ear on every level, at first it's overwhelming, but you realize you're in the center of everything. You have the opportunity to not only move around because there's a mic attached to you, you get a chance to truly play the character. It becomes more three-dimensional than it's ever done before. When that vision is as precise 
as it is with the sound, the music, the special effects, and the tracks of the other actors, you become so on point, you become so clear about the direction of the game that it's going to allow you to work more efficiently, more powerfully, and make you on top of that a better actor on camera as easy as it does behind the mic. She was amazing, really blew me away. And that was just your subject. Um, the actual biggest thing I've learned has been that letting go of the preconceptions of conventional wisdom, being curious and experimenting with difference leads to surprising and exciting places. You know, I encourage you, just be curious about everything. Instinct works. Thank you. Time for a question or two? All right. Any questions? Hi. Hi. Um, loved it. I'm a voice actor, so all that looks awesome to me. <laughs> and I guess my question is, um, how do you get more studios to get a setup like that? Um, it, it, it's developer, it's really developer led. You know, I've been to studios over here, you know, um, and talked to them about the, the whole methodology. And everybody who sees it just goes, hell yeah. But it's the developers who actually govern what, how the studio works. And they, you know, generally studios are kind of, in a sense, a dumb space that just provides a service. Um, now that's why I built the studio here. It's really to get people down to just experience it. Because once you walk into that environment, it's just, it's a hell yeah. And you just want to do it. You know, everybody is, you know, we've been buzzing for 10 years. Um, well, it's 12 years now since we did it. And it's just, it's, just, um, it's kind of exciting. You know, thank you. Cool, thanks. Hi, Mark, thank you, that was amazing. Um, I, I want to be a part of that. I want to like evangelize to people, hey, you should do more um, like new science. like. Look at the methodology and like like letting the actor move freely. That's really how you know the like it lets them go into that character's mind. Um, so I'm, this is just like a technical question. I'm an um, indie game composer slash like sound design person. Um, if there's like this music playing in the background and like all these th uh, things that they're saying, um, how does that like not blend into what they're actually saying? And is it just does does it come to the mic? Yeah, they're using um, okay. uh, really good headphones. Okay. So it's um, all on the headphones. They can hear everything in the headphones. Th and does the turnout always be like 100% like instinct? Or the first instinct is always better. Or do, are there some cases, rare cases, where the actors are like, oh, you know, can we try the rehearsed version of that? Or Well, we kind of throw, what we do is just keep the actor in the instinctive space. Mm -hmm. So we'll go into a scene, and then we'll just go, okay, take it this way. Yeah. And we'll just approach, but it's straight in, it's instant. So you mm -hmm. keep rolling. Mm -hmm. but, but and then you go, oh no, okay, let's, you know, you just, you just angle it. And it's very easy, you're just changing, you create momentum. And when you have momentum, mm -hmm. it's easy to nudge something on the tracks to go in a different direction. Great, thank, thank you, Mark, I think that's it. Great, awesome. Okay. Another hand for Mark, please. Thank you.